Okay, finally have multiple look back. Thank goodness. All right. So today we're going to jump into Oro Terra. Pushing right along into history, we moved up now um, through the Renaissance, through the medieval era, uh, very firmly into our kind of second official musical time frame. So when we talk about styles and music, we're talking about uh, finding similarities over the course of time. So many time periods designated um, as they are today have already been so as we have the opportunity to look back over history and be able to identify some key factors in the music and art, the fashion, the architecture, etc., of certain time periods. So we began um, the the term that's been used now for about ten or fifteen years is antiquity. So we start in the era of antiquity. So anything before um, for about fourteen fifty. So they used to call it ancient time, and now uh, antiquity is the new the new buzzword. The most recent buzzword. We move into the Renaissance, which is 1450 to about 1600. Now we move our way up into um, the Baroque era. And there's some um, discussion as to what dates we should actually be using. Um, I tend to use the more historically accepted ones. And uh, if that changes, you will be among the first to know. So, uh, as we move move on then. Okay, so some characteristics about um, the Baroque era. So, the term Baroque comes from a Portuguese word, um, which means a misshapen pearl. Um, but the word simply describes the, the style of music and art um, that's used during this time frame from about 1600 to 1750. Um, the Baroque era uh, style and art, architecture, and music is marked by three uh, major characteristics. So one is this idea of grandiose dimensions. So one of the best examples of this is St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Um, the piazza, the area outside of um, the church itself um, is larger than two football fields. It stood there, um, it is huge. The church itself is massive. They can hold, standing room, it can hold about 75,000 worshipers. Um, and then you've got the, the piazza on top of that. The works of art were usually fairly large, um, including include the entire ceilings of churches or large rooms. Doing large scale murals would be really nothing to that. Second thing is um, a fondness for drama. You can see this in the paintings um, and in music, this attitude helps with the development of two big uh, genres of music, opera and oratorio. We'll come to those uh, here in the next few days, opera and oratorio. And then between uh, 1600 and 1750, there's a, there's a time of intense religious feeling. So we've got um, Europe, which continues to be uh, a continent that's divided. By this time, you've already got in the United States, um, you have the Columbus who has already come over. Uh, Jamestown is established during this time. The Pilgrims come over during this time. People like William Penn established their colonies um, within the United States. So this fervor for religion really um, dramatically er, inspires what's going on. And, and by this time, you have three distinct branches of Christianity, um, and um, it's 
you've got the Roman Catholic Church, you've got the Eastern Orthodox Church, and you have um, the newly established uh, Protestant Church, which include Church of England, Presbyterian Church. Um, by this time, I think you get into the Mennonites, and there's like one or two others that are, are pretty big within the Protestant movement at that time. So most of it, though, stems from this from this time frame. So talking about art, it's a, it's a little bit of a dark, um, dark painting to see, but um, the Baroque artists were fond of painting figures as though they were like in a scene in a movie and the director just like yelled freeze in the middle of an action scene. Um, the lines are often twisted. The scenes are like really charged with energy. So this is the descent of Christ from the cross by Rembrandt Van Ringe. Um, the symmetry and the balance that was found in the Renaissance era is pretty much gone. Um, you also had this um, practice, which you see here, of uh, spotlighting. So it's kind of like the light and the, the focus is around one particular part of the painting. The Baroque artists also tried to um, overwhelm viewers with the sheer size of their works. So you can see some examples of the Baroque art um, in your uh, in your book for this chapter. So in this one, um, um, the body of Christ is in this kind of misshapen. Um, so you've got one arm up here, one arm hanging, legs bent, head is fallen. Um, there's a clock right here that they've got that they can help build the body um, in the cross. You've got kind of these little spots. And obviously, the main focus is here. You can feel a little bit of crowd. They can go to ears and dance into the, the shroud of the fairy. All these things kind of combine with a lot of use of, of dark colors, which is one thing that Rembrandt was um, really well known for. And you'll see this, this kind of disbalance, unbalanced earth quite a bit in the world part. And there's that, that sense of it being just stemming with. With drama. In terms of intellectual activity, we start to see quite a bit that happens during this era. So this is the era of um, particularly things of the intellect, not so much discovery. The Renaissance era was a little bit more of discovery with people like Magellan and Balboa and Columbus. This now we've you know we we've kind of come out of the pioneering mode a little bit. And then in continental Europe, this is what we begin to see. So Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, theory of gravity, um, actually stood at his tomb a couple weeks ago. Um, in, 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 uh, William Gilbert, his works with electricity, Robert Boyle of chemistry, Rene Descartes, analytical geometry. Descartes, of course, um, also um, logic and philosophy. He's the one who um, famously said, ego is a... I think, therefore, I am Pavito uh, Ego Sum. Uh, Robert Hooke, Cellular Structure of Plants, Harvey. And then Galileo, who's one of the most controversial figures of this era, um, you know, among those people who was trying to see the universe for what it was and not for how man thought it should be. Some of these uh, astronomers, um, so enraged uh, the church at times because, or science in general, because a lot of people thought that the earth was the center of the universe. I mean, why shouldn't it be? And uh, some of them uh, angered the populace so much that they were put to death. And then if that wasn't enough, later on they, they dug up their bones and they burned them, and then they buried them again, just for good measure. Keep the room. Now, in terms of this, this would be kind of more for art 
I think you can make it the case for this art in general, but in music especially, we start to see this idea of what's called a uh, patronage system or the patronage system, um, and the idea was that composers took employment from one uh, individual or one entity. So it could be a, um, a single aristocrat, it could be their family, it could be a local church, local parish, um, the larger cathedral, or it could be for like high-ranking church official, like a bishop, or a bishop or a pope, um, composing music for like their um, their chapel. So it, it had its good sides and it had its bad sides. The great side is that it's steady employment, um, you know, especially if it's if your if your patron is an aristocrat, um, you know, they're always going to have people over for dinner. They're always going to want background music. You know, they they didn't have Spotify back then. So, you know, they had to they had to have their own Spotify channel, just have to be whatever their composer was. Um, so or if it was for the church, um, there's always gonna be a desire for new music throughout the year um, for all the different feasts and festivals um, and things of that nature. So Christmas, Easter, um, other holy days, feast days, saints days, and the like. The downside of this um, if there is a downside, was that the composer had to please their patron. So if their patron preferred a particular genre of music, like string quartets, or if they were very fond of a particular instrument, um, like we'll see a little bit later, um, that meant that the composer had to put their compositional efforts toward whatever it was that their patron was especially fond of. Some people this didn't bother them, others it felt they felt a little bit like it hampered them. Um, other people yet really thrived under the system. And it wasn't just their duties as a composer as well, but a lot of times they would teach, um, they would you know, maybe even help not only write uh, or rehearse with the, the instrumentalist, but they might also have to repair the instruments as well. And you kind of had to be a jack of all trades. Um, you weren't just hired as a composer. If you're good enough, you would be treated, um, not only would you be kind of like on staff with the family, but you could even kind of be like a senior level member of the household. So like getting some of the perks that other people wouldn't. We have evidence of actual contracts that have survived in this time where they would get, um, I don't remember which composer it was, I think it might have been Haydn, where he got like a new suit of clothes every year. And that was part of his, um, Part of his annual bonus is that he got a, a new suit um, that he would get um, so much per uh, per year, and then potential for bonuses on top of that. So, the fact that there was no established repertoire of music during the Baroque era created a huge demand for new music. The reason why um, Baroque composers were able to compose as much music as they did. Um, is kind of bulleted out here. So first off, they use the shorthand system called figured bass. And with figured bass, they often give a melody line that would be played with the right hand. And then there's a, symbols, or a series of symbols and numbers underneath the melody line that indicates what you're supposed to play with your left hand. Now, it doesn't give you specifics, so it gives you the opportunity to kind of fill some stuff in. They would use a melody in more than one work. They believed in recycling. Recycling is not a new, new concept. Um, they would take it and they would repurpose it and use it uh, as many times as either A, they wanted to, or B, maybe they thought they could get away with. I'm sure there's other examples in there. They didn't fuss about the details in the music. Um, there was a lot of opportunity for uh, experimentation during this time, which we don't typically, we wouldn't typically think of um, when we talk about older times, we would think of it as very regimented and very strict. The fact of the matter is that there's a lot of room for wiggle. And there is evidence of a lot of hard work that goes into um, these compositions. From the simple standpoint of not only do you have to write your original version, but then you have to hand copy. Um, usually at the time you have to hand copy out everybody's parts. So, which if you're talking 25 different parts, then you've got to hand write out everything, or hopefully you've got somebody to help you write it all out. You know, who's a competent musician to help you out and getting your music set. And you do this every week. 
It's just part of your normal job, part of your normal routine. Okay, in terms of the performance of the music itself, um, public concerts as we know today hardly existed. Um, it's really not until later in the Baroque era and pushing into the classical era that we start to see concerts like we would expect to see them in modern, in modern context. Um, orchestras were usually fairly small. Um, you didn't have a conductor. You usually had like a keyboard player leader. A lot of times it was the composer themselves. The performances a lot of times took place in churches and palaces. Why do you think that would be? That's a big part of it. Yep. Big part of it. It was, it was who their audience was. Second thing is they were large enough to hold a crowd. You know, you needed a place that was big enough to suit. So those, and kind of long depends upon what the, what the content of the um, of the performance would be as well. It's also during this time that we start to see the establishment of, of opera houses. And their, um, their use becomes greater and greater as this era goes on, pushing into the classical era. And by the time the, the 19th century rolls around, you know, it's, it's considered of the utmost importance. One of the things that surprises a lot of people in terms of um, musical features during this time is the whole idea of improvisation. A lot of people don't necessarily equate classical music or formal classical music, I should say, from, from the Baroque era, Baroque music with improvisation. But the reality is that they had to be able to improvise similar to what jazz musicians today, like that level of improvisation. Um, it was expected. And especially when you're dealing with uh, the idea of the figured bass, you had to be pretty quick on your feet in terms of um, being able to fill in something with the left hand because all you've got is these different symbols um, and numbers and so being able to um, put that all together I'll give you some examples here in, in a minute all right so some characteristics of Baroque music all right first and foremost is the development of homophony so although you have a lot of polyphonic music um, you see this idea of homophony, so you've got an accompaniment, you know, think like a piano or something like that, and then you have a voice or an instrument on top of that. So it would be similar to an accompanied piece or maybe something that you see somebody sing at a recital um, today. And we'll, we'll actually listen to an example of that um, here in just a moment. Um, you have what is called a recitative. Um, recitatives are these. Uh, pieces of music that shoot out a fair amount of text in a short period of time. Um, these are contrasted with what's called an aria, which is usually where you have a shorter amount of text but a longer piece of music. And it's supposed to show off a uh, singer's ability. Again, more on that here in a few moments. Uh, the rhythm itself becomes extremely defined, uh, whereas in the um, the Renaissance era maybe it breathed a little bit more. Um, we start to see metrical rhythm, consistent rhythm coming into um, existence. And then especially when we get to the classical era, that will just be like taken to the next level. There's times, especially when you're talking about harpsichord music in the classical era, where it sounds like um, they, in essence, could be working on a computer keyboard or a typewriter. Because a lot of the music is just it's so strict with its meter, so quick. Um, that it has that sense. The ma use of major and minor keys, a lot of this before then had been modal, sounding a lot like Gregorian chant, those, those types of feel, but now we start to see major and minor keys um, taking place. Um, this gives us a sense of what's called a tonal center, so a spot that all music kind of jumps off at, as well as modulation, which is another uh, term for a key change. So they shift um, keys within a, within a piece. So the doctrine of affections has little to do with love. 
just kind of putting that out there. It said it involves expressing non-musical ideas um, in the music. So in vocal music, this would sometimes take the form of what we call text painting or word painting. Um, in instrumental music, it meant like maintaining the same mood um, through movement or piece of music. So that idea of expressing non-musical ideas in the music. This, this practice continues on to this day. Um, you'll hear this, hear this used, whether you're talking uh, popular music, church music, instrumental, um, it's all there. So one of, the, one of the pieces that really demonstrates a lot of this well is um, a piece by George Frieder Candle called The Voice of Him That Crieth in the Wilderness. So this is an example of a recitative. Um, the text itself is very expressive. It comes from the book of Isaiah. Um, and there's a passage where it's uh, in Isaiah that they're talking about uh, John the Baptist. Isaiah is foretelling um, the life and ministry of John the Baptist. The rhythm itself, um, we start to see a little bit, again, this is kind of early on, um, the rhythm has a little bit of flex to it. The tonal center is pretty well established um, overall. Um, the accompanying instrumentalist simply followed the singer's lead as he or she sped up and slowed down. So. The idea of projecting feelings in music, um, the music itself did not suddenly change character as would happen a little bit later in the 19th century. So um, this piece is very expressive, features a single line of melody with accompaniment. So again, a, a homophonic um, aspect. It does begin in one key, which is B major, and modulate to another key, which is A major. Um, and then it concludes with a very firm um, chord progression so you know what key that we're in. And you'll hear uh, such crucial words such as crieth and highway. Uh, emphasizing this. So the the passage says, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert the highway of our God. So here's, um, here's that. Less than 30 seconds, so pretty straightforward in terms of um, what it's trying to do. Again, declare the text, explain it, and then kind of get out of the way um, a little bit there. Okay, I promised we'd come back to this, and so we have. So, again, two large scale genres of music that developed during this time the oratorio and the opera. So, we'll take the first one. So, oratorio is kind of like a musical drama. Um, the big difference is there's no props, there's no scenery, there's no costumes, there's no acting as we would tend to think of acting. A lot of times the soloists sing particular roles, and then if you have a chorus, well, we made it for a choir, but their, their job is called the chorus. It um, harkens back to Greek, ancient Greek tragedies. So the chorus usually offers commentary on what happens. So with this, again, there's three major parts. <coughs> Excuse me. If you want to add in the orchestra, you can add a fourth one um, for the orchestra part. But the recitative, so again, just like what we heard, a fair amount of text in a short period of time. It was less than 30 seconds, and that was uh, the voice of him who crieth in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert the highway of our God, um, along with the accompaniment. The choruses um, would be for the whole ensemble, um, vocal ensemble, the choir. And then the arias would be shorter amounts of text, longer pieces of music. Usually these arias are two to four minutes, two to five minutes, depending on the writer. 
the interesting thing with um, a lot of this is the ensembles are generally smaller than what we tend to do them with, um, today. I've been a part of um, singing an oratorio or two before, and we usually have like, I mean, dozens and dozens of singers, a large orchestra, and they weren't done like that back in this era. They were done for a lot smaller groups that didn't um, use quite as many, like they'd use like maybe two dozen singers, maybe. Um, they'd use a, a orchestra that's about half to a third of the size of what we use today, probably because those are the conventions of the day. So a great example of a typical oratorio, and probably the most famous one, is Messiah by George Friedrich Handel. So Messiah itself um, has 53 sections to the, to the whole work, 19 choruses, 16 arias, uh, 16 recitatives, two pieces for the orchestra. Um, the part that you usually hear around Easter um, is usually the short version, um, which still might be a couple hours. There's actually three parts to the whole um, oratorio. And they're usually just called the part the first, part the second, part the third. And it um, comes largely out of the book of Isaiah and talks about the coming of, of, uh, of the Messiah. And the, the arias and the recitatives jump between the different voices. So you might have a tenor, you might have the soprano, an alto, or bass, singing these various parts. Um, again, if you do the whole work, it's only three hours long. Um, I think it was two Christmases ago. I think it was two Christmases ago. Um, my wife and I actually listened to the whole thing while we were decorating the house for Christmas. Was a lot of fun. And we did it all on vinyl. We had it on uh, it took six records, six different records. And we, flip them. we had to keep flipping like about every 20 to 25 minutes. We had to keep flipping it over. So um, it's not, Handel's Messiah is not typical in that um, the whole text comes from, from the Bible. Sometimes they would have stuff that they would write themselves, the librettists, the people who wrote the text, they would kind of fill some of it in, kind of fill in the narrative. Um, this part actually, or this oratorio does not have a narrative part like a lot of them would. Um, and Handel only composed the music. Somebody else put together the text, but he wrote the music in, I think it was like 30 days, did the entire thing. He was just so inspired, like, his meals were brought to him, and he just couldn't stop writing um, as he as he progressed. So, as mentioned before, um, arias are these accompanied vocal solos. Um, they can be in an oratorio. Um, they can be in a cantata. We'll talk a little bit more about a cantata um, or an opera, usually accompanied by the orchestra. Um, and the orchestra plays a significant role in this music. A lot of the arias um, demand from the soloist um, some outstanding singing technique. Um, a lot of times the words of the text are um, repeated, and I'll give you uh, a bit here, since we're on the subject of Messiah. Okay. So we heard the tenor recitative. So now I'm going to play for you the um, a tenor aria. I think this is the one that comes right after it. This is um, Every Valley Shall Be Exalted. Thank you. 
Sense of that, you get some of the text painting in this. So he talks about um, the crooked straight. So you get that crooked straight, and he holds the holds the note there. You get a sense of of Handel trying to to stitch together the uh, the words with the music in such a way that it depicts a little bit better what the text is trying to say. So. The text of an aria doesn't always advance the story like recitatives do. Um, so they usually have one idea and they just kind of hammer away at that one idea over and over. Um, they usually have a pretty standard form. Um, and that form is usually there's an A section, there's a B section, and then they'll repeat the A section. It's what we call the capo aria, the capo. Um, being Latin for the head. And so you sing through the whole thing, then you go back to the beginning and you sing the first bit um, again. Usually it's pretty pretty solid, pretty straightforward in terms of the, the meter. You know, you could sense that in this. Dun, 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 So it's, you, know, you can almost set your watch by it. Um, usually it's only during the end of an aria that maybe a, a vocalist might take some liberties, show off a little bit more. Um, if the composer would, back in this time when the composers were still living, if they were, if they would permit those things. What was really neat about a lot of composers doing works for operas and oratorios like this is, if there was a particular vocalist that they wanted to work with, they would actually rewrite the piece to suit their vocal range. So if you had a woman who could sing higher, you'd write the piece higher, rewrite the piece higher, so that way she could show off a little bit more. If you had a bass that could lower, then you'd rewrite it lower so he could show off his, his vocal range a little bit more. And a lot of times, these have a little bit more of the, the memorable um, melodies um, throughout. So on the piece, again, that, that we just listened to, Every Valley, um, you've got the, uh, the, the virtuoso kind of run there on Exalted, that, and it takes a little bit more breath than that to do it all in one shot, which you're supposed to, a little bit out of practice. Um, the crooked straight, which I talked about, and um, there's a line there that says mountain, and when he hits mount, it's the highest note in the passage, and then, and then low is the lowest note in the passage. So you start to see a lot of this throughout. In this case, it doubles the form instead of, or extends the form instead of being the capo with an A, B, A. It runs through it twice, so A, B, A, B, has a lovely introduction um, and a closing section. So this actually, with this um, A, B, A, B form, actually puts it closer to like a pop song or a rock song that we experience today, with like a verse and a chorus um, of, a, of a repeated part. And speaking of the chorus, so the chorus is sung by uh, the chorus. Um, so the chorus is kind of like, well, it is. It's a choir for um, a larger work, whether again, opera or oratorio. Usually more so oratorios. Not all operas have uh, chorus in them. So the choruses, um, as in the pieces of music, are longer than recitatives. Um, unlike recitatives, they repeat words throughout. It's kind of like an aria in that sense. 
there's a little bit of flexibility in the rhythm. Um, however, usually you've got a pretty, pretty strong, pretty stable um, rhythm beat that goes along with it. The accompaniment, um, the the orchestra or whatever happens to be playing, plays a very vital role, much more so than it does um, in the recitative. Um, a lot of times they require a little bit more than just your average um, ability to sing well. And they're more than just uh, long SATV or soprano, alto, tenor, bass, choir songs. Um, they take some work. The Reno County Choral Society out of Hutchinson, as well as the, um, well, I'm blanking on what they call it in Lensburg. Um, but both entities uh, put on Handel's Messiah every spring um, around Easter. So Lensburg, they, through um, uh, Bethany College, they put on um, St. Matthew's Passion by J.S. Bach on Good Friday, and then they put on uh, Handel's Messiah on Easter Sunday afternoon. Um, both are very enjoyable. I've, I've been privileged to sing Messiah twice, no, three times, three times. My freshman year here actually, Central Christian College and McPherson College um, combined choirs along with the McPherson Community Orchestra, and we did two performances of Messiah, one over here at the Free Methodist Church, and one across town at um, Brown Auditorium in McPherson College. It was so cool. My wife actually, what they did is they took um, students from each school and when we sang it over here all the soloists were central people we sang it over there as long as person college people my wife is attending that college at the time i was over here and uh, she was actually the soprano soloist and there all the, all the soloists were when we were freshmen which is which is pretty pretty big deal because there were some some pretty good upper classmen um female singers and uh she got the role so i unfortunately did not get the bass singing roles here i was pretty disappointed about that because i knew i could do it but my buddy Tim actually got the, the, the tenor roles, so that was, that was pretty cool when we did it here. So probably the, the best known chorus is the Hallelujah Chorus. Um, and actually, uh, the name is kind of mistyped. So in reality, the actual name of the piece is Hallelujah. So reality of how it should look. The name of the piece is Hallelujah, and it's sung by the chorus. If we're if we're splitting hairs here, that's how it should be written. Um, so it has um, the, it follows a lot of the ideas that we've been talking about. Um, you can get some text painting in places where it talks about or uh, uses the phrases like King of Kings and Lords of Lords. Um, there's a part where it continues to move like higher throughout when the when the phrase is repeated. Um, you start to get imitation um, where the the different voices are coming in um, and repeating what was heard previously. So here is the, well, let's see, which one do we want to do? We'll do this one. This is the Royal Choral Society. I mean, oh, yeah. And they've done this at the Royal Albert Hall in London every year since 1876. I think maybe even the World Wars. Um, Thank you. 
So the harps are really there at the bottom of the screen. Here's the invitation, people coming in on the same, same bits over and over. I didn't have more to show. So when I was in, when my wife and I were in England a couple weeks ago, we actually, one the, the one day in London, we went to a place called Westminster Abbey, which is this big church in London. And, uh, I stood at the grave of George Reader Campbell. And it's really cool because they give you uh, these audio tour guides and they play uh, this song over the audio tour guide. And it's, it's pretty moving. So, it's one of my favorite pieces of music of all time. It's like, beats just about everything else. Okay. We kind of move into the home stretch today. Um, one of the last large pieces of, uh, or types of music um, that you get is what's called a chorale. Now, one of the leaders in this style is a man by the name of Martin Luther. And he was one of the um, people who inadvertently helped to start the Protestant um, movement, uh, the Protestant Reformation in the... Um, in the early part of the 16th century, right around uh, 1517, um, was when that all goes down. And Luther was very passionate about worshipers um, to be participants, uh, not just observers. So singing uh, these simple songs, uh, which they called chorales, was one way that they could achieve this uh, sense of active participation. So whereas in the... Um, in the Catholic tradition, Roman Catholic tradition, the pieces had been sung in Latin because that was the official language of the church. Um, Luther wanted music to be in the language of the people, vernacular. So since he was in Germany, and he himself was German, he wrote the pieces um, in the vernacular German. So whereas Gregorian chant often did not repeat lines of music, the chorales would have this sense or would have this regularly repeated then. So this leads to this term that we call strophic. So the idea of strophic is it has the same melody with different words. It's just like you would expect for a hymn, or again, for like a rock, a rock, a rock song, or a pop song or something like that. Same melody, different words. So whether you're talking about um, like uh, Amazing Grace, for example. So Amazing Grace, and then the next line, and her next verses, um, was grace that it's hard for when we've been there. Same melody, um, different words. The rhythm is usually pretty consistent um, to make it a little bit easier uh, to access for the people. Um, actually, I'm going to grab this. Um, this slide for uh, the last slide of the day. So oratorios, chorales, and then lastly cantatas. So the, the main thing with, with a lot of these, the oratorios and the chorales are sacred, sacred settings. 
Um, cantatas are usually sacred settings. Um, most of the time they are. Uh, like oratorios, cantatas contain recitatives and choruses and, and arias uh, and the like, and they're usually accompanied either by an orchestra or an organ, because um, these were smaller works, a lot smaller. They usually contained um, maybe from five to ten sections, um, something like that. A lot of cantatas were designed or composed to be inserted into the Sunday morning worship service. So as opposed to an oratorio, which would be a standalone thing, kind of like an opera, these were designed um, so that they could be used within um, the Sunday morning service. So you get, you know, like maybe a third of the way into the worship service and then the, the choir and orchestra or choir and organist would perform um, a cantata. Now, a lot of times what they would, what composers of cantatas would do is they would reach back and they'd grab one of these chorale melodies and they would weave that in there as a, as a means to, to get the audience's um, attention with something um, familiar. So a great example of this is Bach's cantata number 140, um, the fourth part, which um, says uh, is called Zion, Here's the Watchman, which, if time permitted, I would play that for you, however. Um, so we will go ahead and hang it up there. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time, your attention. Appreciate it. We're all great, great folks. <laughs> Thank you.